So Finmore, what's happening out there at the moment? Is there a lot of change or is it consistent with what's happening last year and, and a few adjustments? I know we had Bill uh, last week and he kind of went through it a little bit, but it'd be interesting to get your perspective. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. Thanks, thanks, Justin, for the introduction. Things things aren't so bad out there. What I'll what I'll try. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. What I'll try and do over the next fifteen or twenty minutes or so is give you guys um, some commentary on what we expect over the next four weeks, um, along with some advice on how best to navigate your 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 firm uh, through the renewal process uh, in the run up to the first of uh, December renewal. So, Justin, uh, can everybody see that in front uh, on the screen? Listen, if anyone wants to ask a question, we've been trying this for, for a few weeks now to get it on the chat. So if you could, anyone can ask me a question on the chat, I think I've, I've fixed it, but I will take them as we go along. So thank you. Perfect. Okay. Okay, guys. So I am on, on the agenda this afternoon. Uh, after three years, I suppose, you know, between, you know, the fresh and energy market has been, you know, very tough over the last uh, two to three years. Um, you know, we've seen... Um, you know, it's been very turbulent, I suppose, and we, go, we provide a brief update on, on what the current market conditions are. I'll go through the, the participating insurers for 2022 and what their, their appetites are. Uh, we mentioned briefly the minimum terms and conditions and also outline what renewal uh, forms each insurer is, uh, is looking for this year. Insurers underwriting criteria is unchanged from prior years. However, it is important, so I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on that. I provide some guidance on underwriting conditions or underwriting considerations, I should say, and uh, market presentation, which is largely following uh, last year, albeit, as I said, there are some options being offered on shorter forms this year. We'll provide some high level stats on cybercrime, which remains a, an area of concern for both uh, profession indemnity insurers and solicitors. And then we'll discuss uh, top up insurance and then finish up with um, our best advice to firms for renewal. Okay, so between 2018 and 2021, there was a significant change in insurers' approach to, to underwriting. We experienced insurers exiting the market uh, and a withdrawal of capacity. This resulted in double digit rate increases on um, you know, each year, um, for policyholders, and also a tightening of uh, of the cover being offered by insurers, it was turbulent. It was a turbulent period for traditional professions, uh, in particular such as architects, engineers, uh, contractors who in, who were involved in 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 design and build, and also solicitors. But I suppose while solicitors have had it bad over the last two or three years, just to give you some comparisons, there there are some design and construct contractors who've seen their profession indemnity insurance premiums increase by three or 400% in the last number of years. So those, those professions in particular have had it, uh, have had it very hard. Um, thankfully, quarters uh, one to three this year have seen a return to some level of normality with a uh, stabilization of rates being charged by insurers and also an easing in cover restrictions with more capacity coming back into the market, which means more insurers are looking to quote for, uh, for, for these uh, professions business. Um, the England and Wales solicitors renewal, PI solicitors renewal of the 1st of April and 1st of October can act as an indicator, um, whereas we saw rate increases in 2021 were in the 15 to 20% range, they were in the low single digit this year. Which is uh, which is very welcome, um, which is very welcome for the for the profession. Um, this is the insurance market. I, I, I've spread them over over two slides because there's there's eight participating insurers this year, uh, and and that's up from uh, that's up uh, by one from last year. Now please don't all jump through your your screens uh, delighted with this good news, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll go into that in. In, in, uh, in, a, in a short while. What I've done is I've listed the insurers here in alphabetical order, and I'll go through um, what their target business is. Now, when you see the number of firms, et cetera, here and what their core appetites are, this is from a new business perspective, because they do obviously have existing uh, clients and policyholders and firms that do fa fall outside this core um, appetite. And insurers will look, uh, the, the insurers will look to 
of renewal to their existing client base, even if they do fall outside what I'm showing here. So just starting with AIG, their core appetite is for five plus partner firms. Uh, then we have Alliance. They will look at sole practitioner and multi-partner firms. Uh, they do have a minimum fee threshold of 250,000 euros and also have a maximum conveyancing threshold of 25%. So unfortunately, if you fall outside those, they, 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 uh, they're they not target new business cases for them this year, unfortunately. Um, Aviva, Aviva were a welcome new entrant to the market in 2020. And this year, they're going to consider firms with fees in excess of 1.5. Five million. This is down from three million last year. So there are a whole new cohort of of, uh, of firms that they will consider this year, which is uh, which is good news, we believe. Um, now this is the the new insurer that I was talking about, and, and not to get too excited about this year, it's Berkshire Hathaway. Um, they they're only going to be they're only going to be dipping their toe in the water uh, this year. So they're going to be targeting or selecting the larger uh, top 20 or, th or 30 firms. However, we do expect that their appetite will broaden over the next few years, just like Aviva's has done um, in you know, dropping down the fee threshold from three to 1.5 million. So look, it is a welcome uh, new entrant uh, uh, to the market. And as I said, we do believe that their appetite will, will, uh, will expand over the couple, next couple of years. Uh, DNA Insurance, uh, they quote for sole practitioner and multi-partner firms. Liberty, uh, they've been in the market now a long time. Their core appetite is for two plus partner firms. Uh, QBE, um, as we all know, they, they've gone through some correction over the last couple of years. And last year they decided that they were only going to offer renewal to firms with uh, fee income in excess or greater than 5 million euros. That remains the, the position uh, this year. Uh, then we have uh, Star International. Um, they quote for sole practitioner and multi-partner firms. They are uh, they are O'Leary Insurances, who I work for. They're our exclusive market. No other broker has access to Star International, so if you need a quotation, you must come to us. Um, they are going into their seventh year now, providing professional limited insurance to solicitors in, in Ireland. And uh, thankfully, they have made additional capacity available to us to quote for new business cases. So um, that'll bring a bit of uh, welcome competition uh, to the market uh, this year. Other new entrants, uh, the, the, there isn't really any new uh, uh, other new entrants that are actively quoting 100%, you know, quoting for firms on their own. And we're gone past the deadline now of the of the 31st of October, October so we don't expect any changes to, to the list that I've just uh, gone through. Okay, moving on to the minimum terms and conditions. Um, there are absolutely no changes to the minimum terms and conditions for 22-23, which, uh, which is very welcome. And it's good to bring uh, stabilization and certainty to professional identity uh, uh, markets. So the continuous cover clause and cover for uh, rectification for deficits in the client account, uh, which are very important cover protections for the profession and for your clients. They, they still uh, remain they still remain on on the on the policy the common proposal form was released on the 10th of October there aren't any major changes to it other than changing you know there aren't any major material changes I should say other than um you know moving years on 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 to 2022 etc um whilst there aren't any changes there there are some errors um most particularly in relation to question six which is the type of work split um, landlord and tenant and insolvency uh, areas are both missing from the uh, activity split i think it was just an error in in drafting when i went when i went to marketing but look there are two um spare areas within the question six that you can just slot in uh, insolvency and uh, and landlord landlord and tenant work if 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 if, uh, if you need if you need to So a, a quick question there, Finbar, while I just have you. Uh, yes, what was the conveyancing percentage for Allianz? The sound went and I didn't hear it. Okay, uh, sorry, apologies. 25%, yeah. Justin, and that's okay. total conveyancing, commercial and PPR. Okay, and just while I have you there, on, if I didn't do any conveyancing at all, is that mm -hmm. a benefit to me? And then the second part of that question is, if I didn't handle any client account monies, Mm -hmm. Is that a benefit to me? Yes, both. Uh, but the answer to both of those is yes, Justin. Um, conveyancing probably attracts 
the highest what are the highest rates are uh, you know rating factors by by insurers so the lower you're you're convincing the more uh, the more uh, affordable your your professional indemnity premium is going to be and that rolls on to you know dealing with client monies it's the same if you're not doing any convincing of course the risk is is reduced for professional indemnity insurers and the and the premium will re will reflect that just just what I have you there's another question is there a maximum uh, convincing figure uh, percentage that STAR or CNA will take on for new clients? Is there a maximum uh, we, conveyancing? Yeah. Uh, we, we don't deal with CNA, Justin. Uh, we deal okay. with all the other insurers on that list, which is seven of the eight. We don't deal with CNA, so unfortunately I can't answer What about that. STAR? No, they don't have a, a conveyancing um, a threshold either. Um, but we do uh, we do look for additional information with regards to um, risk management around conveyancing and number of transactions, buy versus sell, et cetera, et cetera, to help us get the, get the best terms available. Thank you. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. So moving on to uh, insurers underwriting criteria, as I said at the outset, this really hasn't changed over the past number of years. So what do insurers look at when they've got their proposal form in front of them? Um, they look at the profile of the practice, whether it's the sole practitioner or, or a two partner plus or, or, or a partnership, I should say. They look at your fee income over the last five years. Um, you know, there's obviously going to be a COVID year now stuck inside in in your in your uh, in, in in your fee uh, history. So a lot of firms are going to have a spike this year in in their fees for the last completed financial year, because um, you know last year we would have been dealing with with a COVID year and there was a lot of a fee reduction because of that. So that you know firms need to need to watch that carefully. And um, inside in all your insurances, we've seen a lot of uh, of fee growth. For that exact reason, um, and you know, we, we, you know, we're discussing that in close detail with the insurers, um, you know, because some insurers are trying to look for point for point increase. So, in other words, if your fees went up by fifty percent, some insurers will just say, "Well, then we're going to look for a fifty percent increase in your premium." Please don't accept that. Um, if if that's what your broker is coming back with, and um, you know, you need to start. You know, your broker should be um, fighting your corner, really, Justin, to say there's a COVID year was last year, so really it wasn't a fair reflection on the increase. You know, that you should be looking at the averages over the last number of years, etc. And you're only really going back to normality. Again, it's really about about using uh, using the best broker and, and making sure they're fighting your corner, really, Justin. I suppose. Would, would would that example be appropriate for any? first quote that you get from the insurance company that you really need to go back and test the water uh, oh, absolutely Absol it. absolutely justin you know i mean i, I know that's obvious but worth well, saying well, yes I, I i agree but i mean for, for example um we wouldn't go back to the client with that in the first place we would go back to the insurers and fight the car before we go back to our clients so we try and have the vast majority of the heavy lifting just undone before we go back to our before we go back to our clients um, so they'll obviously look at your areas of practice, whether there's conveyancing, et cetera, personal injury litigant, wills, trust, probate, I suppose, just like, just, um, you know, kind of phrase that my, my own boss would use, Ireland is a small place. Um, you know, just like insurance brokerages, you can't just concentrate and 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 uh, and specialise in one area. We have to be a grocer shop and and deal with with all areas of of, uh, of law or of insurance to try and make to try and make a living. So obviously, they look at your areas of practice. They look at your historic exposures, conveyancing in particular, and um, that they, they still do look at your undischarged undertakings. So um, I suppose a bit of advice. Is that you know most especially in the historic years over five years ago, if you still have outstanding um, un, uh, you know undischarged undertakings over five years old, I'd recommend that you would you know in your covering letter with your proposal form that you would say, look, there are outstanding uh, undischarged undertakings. However, they're all in hand; they're just stuck with land land registry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that you'll have no issues in discharging any of those. That's the kind of, you know, it shows insurers that you're on top of your, your undertakings res register and that you've got your risk management procedures around all of those things. They're the kind of things that insurers like to see, because obviously when a conveyancing a transaction goes wrong, it's quite, it's going to be a sizable claim against, against a PI insurer. They look at your, they'll obviously look at your, your, uh, your 10 year claims experience. Uh, if you have had claims, please just provide a, a brief summary. They just want to know what happened, what's the current position, and um, if it's closed, how much was paid out, or if it's still open, you know, what's the current reserve that insurers are, are applying? And I suppose most importantly, what has the firm done to ensure that a, a matter similar to what has just occurred doesn't happen again? That's the kind of information that the clients are saying that insurers want to see, you know, short and concise. 
their time is limited. The number of, in, of professional indemnities, uh, insure, uh, underwriters in Ireland is limited. So, you know, they don't want to see your entire claim file of 150 pages. You know, if that comes into an, an underwriter's inbox, there's only one place it's going and it's not into the priority list. That's, I, I can assure you that. And um, look, risk management, I, mean, I was talking to Justin about it earlier, you know, the firm's uh, attitude and approach to risk management is still very, very important, most especially, you know, with uh, a, a lot of working from home uh, happening, you know, that there are a lot of firms who are still on three, three days or two days uh, working from home, so they need to know um, what's the process for supervision. Um, of, of your of, of your staff at home and also cyber security, which is very, very uh, important. Um, the question in relation to standalone cyber cover um, is still on the proposal form this year, and they're asking, you know, uh, they're asking for the details of if you have a cyber policy in place, and if you do, um, if such policy has cyber crime cover as well. Um, there are some insurers last year who charged additional premiums if you didn't have a cyber policy in place. So if you are getting the quotation back and you don't have a cyber policy or you do have a cyber policy, um, find out, make sure from your broker, uh, ask the question, are my insurer charging me for not having a cyber policy in place? If so, how much? And then maybe consider buying a cyber policy to try and save money and get the benefit of having two uh, good policies in, in, uh, in place. Uh, Just a, a, so, a, a, a query, yeah. a few more ways to have you. Uh, why don't the insurers uh, send out a, uh, you see it there, the send out a claim statement automatically at this time of the year? Um, they, they they should do, um, Justin, to be honest okay. with you. Um, some insurers maybe just, a lot of brokers get out early with their proposal forms, firstly, before before they actually get the claims experiences from, from the insurers. So they, they, the brokers should have them, or the insurers should have issued them. Just pick up the phone and ask them first. They, they should be able to issue it absolutely instantaneously. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to underwriting con considerations, I suppose after three, after three years of full or longer proposal forms or common proposal forms being requested by insurers, certain insurers are now um, um, offering early renewal on shorter renewal uh, on shorter renewal forms. Uh, Star and Alliance are to mention just two. You can obviously still complete the common proposal form to obtain uh, quotations, but look, your broker, I suppose, is best placed to give you advice on what form you should be completing. So please, um, you know, engage early with your with, with your broker. I'd be very surprised if 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 uh, or you should be very surprised if you haven't heard from your broker at this stage with regards to what uh, renewal proposal form he wants uh, completed. Um, we was that a we, reference, sorry, Finmar, to early birds as well, which we're yeah, hearing about? Yeah, or? yeah, there is. Um, I suppose Star are offering an early bird. We, we, we would like calling it early bird, Justin. It's early renewal or timely Excuse renewal. Excuse me. Yes, way. early renewal. Yes, yeah, early renewal is is you know it's it's it is best practice to try and get these things away early if you can. And yes, Star. Um, I suppose. We, uh, you know, we, we're, we're expecting rates to be largely flat this year, so insurers are not going to be looking for rate increases. However, one or two insurers have ind indicated single digit rate increases that they might be looking for. Again, your broker is the best place to, to argue those uh, points uh, with, with insurers. Is there any disadvantage to that, do you think? or No, I, do, I don't believe there is, Justin, I suppose. Yeah. We... we, we... <sighs> We obviously, in all your insurances, we obviously deal with profession indemnity on, for, for other professions, architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, etc. And in the first two quarters of 2022, we were quite surprised to see proposal forms coming back. And just like solicitors, it's based on your last completed financial year. And we saw quite a spike in, in, uh, in the turnover and fees for those traditional professions. So I'm not saying we had a crystal ball, but you know, when engineers and quantity surveyors are busy and their fees are going up, you know, it, it does follow on that solicitors' fees kind of track those professions as well. So, as I said, not saying that we, we had a crystal ball, but we kind of did foresee maybe that solicitors' fees were going to go up. So, the insurer that we deal with uh, the most, which is Star, um, we went to them and said, look, we think there's going to be a bit of fee growth here from, from solicitors' firms, and we want to try and offset that. So, what we agreed with Star is that they would give us um, a fee holiday of seven and a half percent um, if insurer if firms accepted an early renewal offer justin so that means if your fees went up by seven and a half percent 
your premium was going to be the same as last year. So in essence, that is a 7.5% rate reduction. There are no other insurers on the market who are offering a rate reduction like that. So that is very, very welcome, we believe, for the profession. Now, if the, if the, fee, if the firm has had a 15% fee uplift, well, then they still get the 7.5% fee holiday and the premium only goes up by 7.5%. So that they're still getting the benefit of a 7.5% reduction. Now, we are seeing firms with fees in, fee increases of 30 or 40%, Justin, or 50%. You know, on those cases, we're bringing those to the insurers saying, we can't look for an extra 32 or 37.5% from, from clients. And we're making the argument about the COVID year, et cetera, et cetera Justin. And we are getting, we are getting good hearing, hearings from our insurers on that. Yeah. Just a quick question there from somebody. Uh, have you noticed any guide as to what the total cost of PII basic on top of bears as a percentage of gross income? So if I understand that correctly, is if I do 100 grand worth of turnover, is, yeah. does that, is there it, a- It's very, very hard. To, 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 to pick a global rate like that, Justin. I suppose yeah. for, for the larger sized firms, it's anywhere between, sorry, medium to larger firms, it's anywhere between two and 3%. But for smaller firms, you can't do that because their fees are, you know, could be 150 or 200,000 euros. So it, it is very, very hard. And, you know, certain insurers have minimum premiums, et cetera, that they, they must, you know, must get to pay pay for reinsurance, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very hard, unfortunately, to give to give a global, uh, especially on the primary. I can give it on top up, which I'll go into in a minute. So that will be with the with the second half of, of, of your question, if that's OK. Um, as I said, we expect cyber to be a key consideration and additional questions regarding cyber security, such as multi-factor authentication and dual verification on, on bank accounts. You know, that's still very, very important. Um, it's a massive area of concern for fashion indemnity insurers at the moment, uh, Justin, is the is this rectification of uh, deficit in, in the client account. Um, you know, and, and given given the focus on cyber, and, and last year, as I said earlier, some insurers were charging for it. So it's, it's very important that um, that firms, you know, spend a lot of time and effort getting their their cyber protections uh, you know, in 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 in, in place. Sticking, sticking with cyber, cyber, I suppose I'm referring this here to the, you know, as the, the known unknown on the basis that, you know, we can anticipate the additional potential risks and exposures, you know, that firms may have, but there's uncertainty around the timing and the impact of those losses. And, um, you know, again, as a reminder, solicitors PI policies provide cover for rectification for deficits in the client account as a result of a cyber crime, et cetera, uh, for example. That cover that is being provided under the minimum terms and conditions is unique for solicitors professional indemnity insurance insurance it is not being provided under any other professional indemnity insurance policy for any other profession so you know to be fair credit where credit is due the law society have done a great job for its members in in negotiating in negotiating uh, uh, that, that cover and when you think about it, the minimum uh, the minimum level of cover that's being provided is 1.5 million any one claim. So that means that you could have several uh, uh, rectification of deficit or cyber losses, if you want to call it as that. You could have several cyber losses up to 1.5 million, and that would be covered under your professional indemnity uh, policy. You know, I suppose whilst it is a fantastic um, cover to have, Justin. The question probably needs to be asked, and maybe not for this form, is it a barrier for new entrants into the market? As a broker, I personally believe it is, um, because it is a big known unknown for insurers. You know, especially when we're talking to the likes of Lloyds of London, um, they can't get their heads around that there's a cyber uh, crime element of cover being given under a professional indemnity policy. You know, over in Lloyds, as far as they're concerned, cyber is one class of insurance, Professional indemnity is another class. They're underwritten by two separate two separate uh, sectors, etc. Differing under, underwriting uh, methods, questions being asked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, it's something that we we do an awful lot of work on with insurers explaining, and that's why you know there are cyber policies that are available that give cyber crime that gives protection to professional indemnity insurers. That's why they like to see firms that have that 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 cover in 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 place just some high level figures here justin just to show you and this is for o'leary insurance placed solicitor firms only not for the rest of the market because we're obviously not privy to that uh, to that information so 
since 2018, we have had 36 losses reported to us with total losses of 4.6 million euros. They're losses that would not have been covered under a profession demonstry policy, but for that cover that we that we mentioned, the rectification for deficit and client account. The average loss is 144,000 euros. Now, when you look at that average loss, um, you know, cybercrime policies can give cover for cybercrime for 100,000 or 250,000. So having a cybercrime policy in place does would cover you for the average loss, if, if, uh, if, if you know what I'm saying, uh, Justin. And in addition to that, having a cyber policy in place does ring fence and protect your profession indemnity policy for such losses. You know, your profession indemnity policy is a compulsory purchase. It's required by, by law. Um, and if you have one of these losses and you don't have a cyber policy in place, you have to renew your, your, PI, your PI policy next year, no matter what, what premium the insurance company throws at you for having that claim under the policy. At least if you have a separate cyber policy in place that had that cover, it's after ring fencing your, your profession indemnity policy. And you can decide next year if your cyber policy the premium goes through the roof, at least you've got the choice to renew or not uh, that policy if the premium is, is, is so high. Justin, we could do a whole I, uh, session so, on, yeah, on, like, on, on, yeah. on cyber. Uh, and look, I'm sure a lot of people have seen my colleague. Uh, and there was a question there, uh, why would you buy taking out cyber cover, it's included in the PII cover. I think you've answered that question by saying, you know, it, it, there's actually a risk to the PII uh, premium in the future year, and wouldn't you be better off uh, ring fencing it off and paying a slightly additional premium and having a better yeah. quote? I presume not all uh, cybersecurity insurance is the same, like. Yes, absolutely correct. Well, sorry, no, no they're not, Justin. <laughs> yes. Not all cyber policies are the same. You can get cyber insurance policies out there for a thousand euros. That gives cyber crime. However, the profession indemnity policy pays first. Not the yes. cyber, not the cyber policy. So please, yeah. buyer, buyer beware. Yeah. Ask your broker. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, we're, we're, we're just running into the last three minutes, so I'm conscious yeah, that we absolutely. Yeah. Look, top up insurance. You know, every firm needs to to um to review their exposures, past and present, to see if the minimum level of cover of 1.5 million. Just remember, inflation peaked at 9.1 percent, or didn't peak? It peaked last last month, but in July alone, it was 9.1 percent. You know, building reinstatement costs are, are gone up, so conveyancing has gone up, etc. We have an exclusive facility with Zurich Insurance. You can buy an additional million, million, um, million cover for as little as sixteen hundred and fifty euros. So you know that is very, very competitive and very affordable when you compare it to your one point five million, uh, you know, premium that you're paying for your for your for your primary for your primary cover. If you do buy cover, you know there is a bit of work involved for the broker, so get your get your form back. Uh, quickly. So look, just to sum up, Justin, engage early with your broker, make sure you've got your proposal form completed correctly. Talk to all your staff to make sure that they're not worried about any files, um, you know, that may give rise to a claim. If there are circumstances that may give rise to a claim, please, do, please report them to, to, your, to your broker or to your insurer. That's what you pay, you pay your premium for professional damage insurance for. You, know, you don't want to be cut out in future years where you haven't re reported a claim and you should have done so. Please understand the benefit of the continuous cover clause if you're considering move to another insurer. Again, your broker is best placed to, uh, to, to discuss that view. And you know, finally, uh, in conclusion, Thank you for your attention, and please do ask us for a quotation. We're confident we can help you. Over to you. Sorry for rushing the last couple of slides. So, yeah, no problem. So there, there's a quick question there. Any tips what, uh, if I'm uh, conducting um, uh, conveyancing as to how I might risk the mitigation and insurance? Like what? Yeah, I suppose, um, you know, maybe outlining the number of transactions, Justin, because just because you're, you're you know, that there are firms out there that can have 50% of their activity is conveyancing. But that might only that might only be seventy five thousand of fees. So the number of transactions is still quite small. So I would be in my covering letter saying, whilst my conveyancing activity is fifty percent, that only represents thirty transactions, and then maybe break down those transactions between the buy and the sell side, because obviously, um, you know, the the the, the buying side will carry more risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that's definitely one way um, of of trying to mitigate mitigate against that. Very good. So unless you have anything uh, else to add, uh, if they need to contact you, just contact you through O'Leary Insurances. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Or look, Justin, I, I, you have my contact details. If, you yeah, want to if they want to get in contact device. through me, there's no problem. Yeah. 
Yep. We'll be sending out a recording uh, later in the week, early next week. Uh, our next session is on the 16th of November, where we're joined by Andrew Cody, who's a district court judge, who's going to give us some tips on becoming a judge. Uh, if this PII market isn't for you anymore and you'd like to uh, join, join, join the <laughs> public sector. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. Finbar, thanks a million for, for being with us. If you have any... Pleasure. Thanks for the invite. We'll talk to you soon. Slot. Talk to you again. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.